So have you ever heard of somebody having a stroke within their eye? In eye care, we call them retinal vein occlusions. And in this video, I'm gonna break down the pathogenesis of how it affects the eye, ultimately our vision, and then the treatments for it. That's today's video, let's take a look. Hello and welcome, this is Dr. Alan here from the Dr. Eye Health Show, helping you learn all about the eyes and vision. If you're new here to the channel, definitely consider hitting that subscribe button down below so that you don't miss any of my future videos about eye care topics such as this one. In fact, this is a huge shout out to many of the viewers who have requested this video specifically for almost a full year, and I apologize it took me this long to get to it, but here it goes. First of all, retinal vein occlusions are a pretty big topic in eye care, both in optometry and ophthalmology. This is something we all have to learn and really know very well because it can be a serious cause of vision loss and potentially other complications and issues within the eye. And oftentimes doctors will try to easily explain to their patients what's going on by just saying that they had a stroke within their eye. Now, there could be many things in the eye that could be described as having a stroke. This is, happens to be a vein occlusion where one of the veins in the eye becomes occluded and then you have all these problems. There's also artery occlusions, completely different thing. We're gonna save that for another video sometime in the future. But when we talk about vein occlusions, there's generally three types in eye care. There's a central retinal vein occlusion a hemicentral retinal vein occlusion, and a branch retinal vein occlusion. You see the retina in the back of the eye is known to have a dual blood supply. This means it has arteries and veins that go through the optic nerve and into the eye and supply blood and oxygen and nutrients to the front surface of the retina. But then it also has another set of blood vessels on the back of the eye through what is called the choroid. Now the veins that I'm talking about in this condition, these are the blood vessels within the retina that go through the optic nerve and actually supply the anterior portion of the retina. Now, depending on the location of the occlusion. It could be in the central retinal vein. This is right where the blood vessels first enter and exit the optic nerve going in and out of the eye. Then there's the hemicentral retinal vein occlusion, which is a little bit more anterior to that. But then you have a full branch retinal vein occlusion. This occurs more within the retina and has a very distinct look to it. When someone has a central retinal vein occlusion, such as this, the doctor will see a lot of blood throughout the entire retina. It affects all of the areas of the retina. And oftentimes in school, we're learned to recognize this as blood and thunder. Where somebody with a branch retinal vein occlusion, this is where the retinal vein that has a branch to it inside the eye, that one is selectively occluded and then it's just kind of a whole arm or section of that vein that's been blocked off, such as in this picture here where you can see the blood just kind of pooling in the retina just in one specific quadrant. I think by far in my practice, I see branch retinal vein occlusions much more often and central retinal vein occlusions coming just kind of close second. But thankfully, the pathogenesis for all these conditions are very similar and I'll kind of want to break these down just so that you understand what's happening within the eye. Now, just for simplicity's sake, let's go over branch retinal vein occlusions first. We call them BRVOs in the clinic. And I like to describe BRVOs first to like students, first because the BRVOs are a little bit simpler to understand and the same pathogenesis that is affecting the branch retinal vein occlusion, it can also be applied to all other forms of vein occlusions. Now within the eye, the central retinal artery and vein, they travel through the optic nerve and then they spread out into different quadrants of the eye. You have the superior temporal quadrant, the superior nasal quadrant, you have the inferior temporal quadrant and the inferior nasal quadrant. Now, when these blood vessels go out this direction, they, both the artery and the vein, they travel together. And the artery crosses over on top of the vein. This is important to remember. Think of it like the different hoses that maybe you left out for watering your lawn one summer. The arteries are gonna cross over on top of the vein. And what happens is that with age, uh, different lifestyle factors like inactivity, people who don't exercise and they have increased blood pressure, people who eat really poorly, who eat a lot of greasy burgers and pizza, uh, as well as people who smoke, they're at increased risk of developing what is called arterio and arthrosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis is where the blood vessel, the artery itself, the walls of it become thicker and more rigid. And then atherosclerosis is where the cholesterol and fatty plaques of your diet end up sticking on the inner lining of your blood vessels. And this ends up collecting and ultimately can become a plaque that blocks up the artery. And that's what we call a stroke and eventually a heart attack. 
So all of these different things kind of accumulate and cause the artery, which is, again, is running over on top of the vein, to kind of swell up, become more rigid and thick, and they share what is called an adventitial sheath. That's where the artery and vein cross over each other. They share the same tissue. And because the artery is getting thick, it starts to push on that vein, causing the vein, the amount of space for the blood to flow through, gets smaller and smaller. And with that, you create more turbulent blood flow within the vein, which that turbulence causes damage to the inner lining of the vein. And we, that inner line called the endothelium, because it gets damaged, the body tries to repair it. And with the repairing process, the new tissue, the new endothelium isn't quite the same. And ultimately with sustained increased blood pressure and continued damage, eventually it ruptures. And that's when the blood breaks through the vein and just spreads throughout the back of the eye. Now, most commonly a branch retinal vein occlusion we will see in the superior temporal quadrant because there's more crisscrossing of arteries and veins in that quadrant. Thankfully, if you're young, under the age of 50, your risk of having one of these conditions is much lower. There's still a possibility, especially if you have a hypercoagulability issue, such as factor V Leiden that maybe runs in your family, or maybe you take some sort of birth control, like if you're a woman, you're taking birth control. That also carries a small risk of having a higher chance of one of these, especially when you're young. And when an eye doctor sees this, whether they're an optometrist or ophthalmologist, they're going to recognize, whoa, they have all this blood in the back of the eye. They have a BRVO. Okay, we have to think, do they have perfusion? Do they have blood flowing to the retinal tissue or not? Oftentimes in the clinic, we can recognize white spots on the retina that we call cotton wool spots. That's often an indica indication that there is not perfusion and we call that ischemic branch retinal vein occlusions. Or your doctor may order what is called a fluorescein angiogram, which is where they put a fluorescein sodium dye through your arteries and veins and they take pictures of the back of the eye and they can literally see where blood is still flowing within the retinal tissues. And in a BRVO, you can have the ischemic and non-ischemic versions. The less blood flow or more ischemic versions of a vein occlusion, the worse the vision and the consequences within the eye are going to be. So people can have milder non-ischemic branch retinal vein occlusions that they may not even notice that they have any vision changes or any sort of problem within the eye at all, or they can have very ischemic vein occlusions, which ultimately lead to blank spots in their vision and even blurred vision. Now, ultimately what happens because of these retinal vein occlusions, uh, how it affects your vision is that the retina itself is getting starved of oxygen and these nutrients. And so the retina starts to release these inflammatory proteins. These inflammatory mediators are gonna cause the blood vessels around this kind of ischemic area that's not getting its proper nutrients to, it's gonna allow these blood vessels to start leaking. And with this increased leakage and perfusion of fluid from the blood vessels, it's gonna cause swelling. This increased amount of fluid, which is supposed to essentially kind of heal the eye, ends up causing kind of a blister formation within the retina. And we call that macular edema. And with that, it changes the architecture of the retina and you lose a lot of your eyesight. Your vision becomes extremely blurry. So if this doesn't happen, if it's just a mild vein occlusion, you may not notice any difference in your visual acuity. And that's why it's really important to still see your eye doctor every year because they can often see that this happened maybe in the past. Maybe there's some sort of indication that you had this a long time ago, or perhaps they're catching one live going on right now. I remember a time during my residency, I had a gentleman coming in just for a pressure check for his glaucoma, and I still looked inside of his eye to look at the optic nerve, and I could see he was having a vein occlusion right that moment. So in that case, I immediately said, hey, sir, you're having another issue that's unrelated to your glaucoma. Your visit's gonna last a little bit longer. We went and checked his blood pressure, and his blood pressure was alarmingly high. And that really takes me on to the treatment for something like a branch retinal vein occlusion. Now, my job is to first recognize, diagnose what is going on, and also figure out if there is swelling of the retina, and ultimately guide kind of treatment and management for this disease. One of the big issues, again, like this gentleman that was in this story when I was at the VA, he had really high blood pressure. So being that so much of this disease has to do with your blood pressure, your cholesterol, potentially if you have diabetes, other things like that, it's important that I manage and 
get this patient to be seen by a primary care physician, their general practitioner, order appropriate blood work so that we know what's going on, what are the risks for potential stroke, heart attack, because that's life-threatening. So in this particular case, after we knew that gentleman had high elevated blood pressure that day, we also made a direct referral to get blood work and then go see his family doctor so that he could get his blood pressure under control. Now, thankfully that gentleman that day still had 20-20 despite having a branch retinal vein occlusion because his macula wasn't swollen at all. He had essentially a non-ischemic branch retinal vein occlusion, but that gentleman, we still had to watch him for several months because it's possible it could have gotten worse. He could have had macular edema that developed. If you are somebody who ever does develop vision changes from a vein occlusion, such as a BRVO, when you have that swelling, you are gonna be referred to a retinal specialist. With a retinal specialist, they will again do that fluorescein angiogram so they know where the perfusion and non-perfusion is, and then they will offer different treatments. Most commonly today, the first line of treatment are injections of a medication known as the anti-VEGF, which stands for vasoendothelial growth factor. And that's one of the special growth factors that's released from the retinal tissue when there is inflammation and not not enough, kind of enough, not enough nutrients and going to the retina itself. Now, I don't mean to scare people when I say you're gonna get an injection, a needle going into the eye, but thankfully these treatments work amazing. And oftentimes with repeated treatments and your close watching from your doctors, they can get things under control. And most people do have a good visual prognosis after a vein occlusion like this. Most people do have vision better than 2040, even if no treatment is given, but even better when there is treatment. And alongside the possible injections for treatment for this sort of macular edema from a vein occlusion, your doctor could also recommend either laser or an injection of a steroid inside of the eye. These have been kind of older technologies and treatments that we've used. However, they can still be used in conjunction with the anti-VEGF injection. Again, something that you'll have to leave open to discussion with your retinal specialist. And believe me, they know what they're doing. So uh, if I was having this, I would just trust everything they say. Now in general, these different treatments that I just described, those are the same treatments that we use for all forms of retinal vein occlusions. The central retinal and hemiretinal vein occlusion, it all happens for the same pathogenesis of the branch retinal vein occlusion, except it's at different locations within the eye. However, the central retinal vein occlusion is a little bit more dramatic and has a higher risk of other complications. One of those big issues is a certain type of glaucoma that I, I wanna kind of go over just a second what a central vein occlusion is so I can better explain what might be going on with that type of glaucoma. Now again, the central retinal vein, it's the central vein, and so when that gets blocked off, the entire back of the eye looks completely filled with blood. Again, blood and thunder is what we call it in school. That's what they train us to see. And oftentimes this does come along with some sort of uh, macular edema. So oftentimes when, the doctor, when your eye doctor sees this, they're gonna send you to a retinal specialist right away. But it's also important for them to consider doing a certain technique called gonioscopy. This is a special type of contact lens that's placed onto the eye after the eye's been numbed with some sort of eye drop medication. And then your doctor is able to look through this special type of contact lens because it's got mirrors on it and allows us to look at the angle structure of where the aqueous humor, which is the fluid inside the eye that controls the eye pressure, we can see where the air, the, that aqueous humor is draining out of the eye. This angle, which is formed by the iris and then the cornea, they come together at a certain spot, and that's where the fluid drains out of. Now, what happens is because a central vein occlusion is so dramatic, there's really, really no nutrient getting to the retina. It's being starved very quickly. So new blood vessels start to grow inside the eye. These new blood vessels, which we call neovascularization, these new blood vessels can grow within the angle, within that drain. And that means that there's nowhere for that aqueous humor fluid to go, so the eye pressure starts to go up really high. And this can be a very serious form of glaucoma because that increased eye pressure can push on the optic nerve and it can kill the nerve. And once the nerve is dead, bye-bye vision. 
And in eye care, we call that 90 day glaucoma because within the first one to three months, that's when per a person's most at risk of developing this glaucoma from a central retinal vein occlusion. Now, the ultimate takeaway I hope you get from this video is not just understanding the pathogenesis of a retinal vein occlusion and its treatments, but to take advocacy for your own health. If you're having vision changes, make sure you see your eye doctor. And based on their recommendations, follow whether they want you back in a month. If they prescribe you treatment, make sure you follow that treatment. They want what's best for you and your vision. And then second of all, be an advocate for your health in regards to your blood pressure, your diet, uh, and your lifestyle in general. If you're somebody who is already getting in your older age, you're over the age of 50, maybe you have not eaten very well in your life, if you eat a lot of greasy foods, cheeseburgers, um, pizza and things like that, that that's not necessarily good for your body. And if you're inactive, if you're someone who doesn't exercise very much, I know it can be tough for a lot of us and it's something I'm working on, but being active, eating healthy, not smoking, these all can contribute to having less chances of having a vein occlusion, whether that's in one eye or both eyes. And it's overall going to reduce your chance of having a heart attack and stroke. And I think we can all agree those are all important things. So if you like today's video going deeper into our eye health condition, go ahead and smash that like button for me and leave a comment in the section below of either your story involving something like a vein occlusion, or if you have another question about an eye health related topic or disease or treatment, again, drop a question or comment in the section below because I read those comments and I would love to get back to you and possibly make a video all about that topic. Otherwise, if you are new here to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below so you don't miss any of my future videos. Again, this is Dr. Joseph Allen here from Dr. Eye Health. Keep an eye on it, and we'll talk to you soon.